Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone. It's the last day of November. Can you believe it? We're almost through this very unique year. Uh, I think of this year as a pause, a time for all of us to stop and to think about those things that we love, the things that we had that we no longer have, and the things that we truly want in our lives. And I realize as we go through this time, and I'm missing my friends like there's no tomorrow. Uh, let's hope that there is. Uh, I, it's, uh, that's the hardest part for me, just not being able to physically see my friends, hug them, celebrate them. But I do have this platform. And today is very special because tonight is the full moon. And that means that today we are doing the full moon positive book club. Now, just to tell you a little bit about tonight's moon, it's the beaver moon. It was named after the Native Americans who believed that this was the time when under the full moon, the beavers would make their homes uh, doable for the winter. And that's something I think we should all be thinking about. I think that all of us uh, should take a collective pause and just take January and February off unless you are an essential business, all of us. And then in March, let's end up dancing in the streets. Now, I'm very excited about today's show. And before we begin, I am going to dedicate today's show to Avery Summers, who is one of my favorite entertainers, dear friend. She lives down in Florida. We haven't seen each other, obviously, for some time. She was scheduled to be in New York uh, just a few months ago for the Cabaret Convention, which obviously did not happen physically, although she was there remote. But a few years ago, when I was doing my live show, Richard Skipper Celebrates, she was one of the people that I reached out to, having seen her uh, just by walking into the Carlisle one night and hearing her magnificent voice. So I asked her to do the show, and uh, I said, uh, I haven't lined up a musical director yet. Is there anyone that you would recommend? And she said, Oh, do you know my friend, Dana <laughs> P. Rowe? And I said, well, I know of him, but I don't know him. I called him, and he's one of the busiest men in the business. So <laughs> we had to check his calendar, but luckily for me, he was available. Uh, hello, Dana. It's good to see you tonight. Yeah, it's good to see you, Richard. I'm so excited to be here. I was so entranced. I was listening to you speak, and I, I then all of a sudden I popped up on the screen. So I'm just there delighted to be here with you. Well, yeah. I want to ask you, before we delve into today's book, and there's a reason, and I'll explain to everyone why we chose this book, uh, but I want to know how you're doing really in the midst of the time that we find ourselves in. How am I doing really? Um, I just, I usually, I check in with myself often during the day. As you know, you know that I'm that that person. Uh, I'm doing really well. Uh, I mean, there's great, where uh, many people are experiencing great sadness. I have experienced sadness during this time and loss. And uh, that said, I think that there's also some really great things going on here. Mm -hmm. And I'm what's called an ambivert, which means I'm just extroverted enough and I'm also very much an introvert. So there's a part of me that really loves this. <laughs> I love being hunkered down, you know, with my husband in the next room working remotely, me working remotely here. And you like each other, so that helps. And we do. We get along really well. <laughs> I keep saying to my husband, Danny, I said, it's a good thing we like each other. Because oh, yeah. uh, we have spent more time together. We've been Essential. together 30 years, but this year is oh, uh, the time that we're really uh, forced to be in that position. Now, I want to go back. Uh, well, today also is the full moon. Uh, yeah. are, are you ever affected by the full moon? I bet I am. <laughs> I, I could I could almost promise you that I am. Do I know what it does to me? Uh, there have been times, actually, I notice it more in what's going on around me. Sometimes we'll be walking in the city and I go, wow, 
things are a little crazy right now. And then lo and behold, it'll turn out that it's actually a full moon. Uh, now, this past year, uh, well, th I, I, listen to me, I'm going this past year, it was earlier this year. I know, this year that lasted five years, I think everybody, <laughs> I think seems everybody like it was forever. <laughs> But you and I, you know, work together uh, on one of the Richard Skipper Celebrates shows. Yeah. But you are also a coach. And mm -hmm. you reached out to me, uh, I guess, was it uh, April or May, I think? It it was. Yeah, it was early in the pandemic, wasn't that it? You yeah. reached out to me and you told me about this workshop that you were going to be doing uh, based on the book Positive Intelligence by mm -hmm. Shirzad uh, Charmaine. And uh, would I be interested in doing it? And we had a very small but very mighty group. Um, yeah, and yeah. so since I do the Full Moon Positive Book Club, and my goal with this is to uh, bring positivity into the world uh, from book meeting to book meeting. Uh, that means all the time. Uh, yeah. Then um, I thought that this would be a perfect book to talk about today. And I'd like to go back before we even get to the book. Uh, we're going to go with one of the exercises in the book. Okay. Uh, and I want you to go back to your five-year-old self. Mm. And I want you to let everybody know about who Dana P. Rowe was uh, as a five-year-old child. Who was I as a five-year-old child? I was, uh, I was a sweetheart. I was well, actually... You know, there were a lot of things, but really in one phrase, I am a little teapot. I was a little teapot when I was five years old. That was my theme song. And that was the song I sang for my my family. It made them incredibly happy. And I thought, well, if it makes them happy, I'll do it. Uh, so, but I was I was a precocious little child and the piano was where I lived. Music was my first language. It uh, literally and figuratively and on many, many levels. And uh, yeah, who was I as a five-year-old? Um, I was a cool kid. Mm -hmm. I was a cool kid. And I was uh, delighted to be here. You know how there? The, I, I, have, uh, I have two uh, beautiful adult children and three beautiful grandchildren. And uh, every child is different. Mm -hmm. And there are some children you kind of go, I don't know if they're really all that happy to be here, but I was definitely happy to be here when I arrived. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, I'm the oldest of four children mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing the dichotomy of the kids coming out of one family and how different each one of us are. Like night and day. I mean, if there were like five different things, you know, right, they're all completely and utterly different. Yeah. Now this exercise that you know that I'm referring to, yeah. um, and I'm telling you, it works, folks. It works. <laughs> I, it's pretty powerful, uh, isn't it? When, uh, when I'm dealing with someone and there's a conflict or something, I try to imagine them as their five-year-old self. And I've been utilizing, believe it or not, uh, some of the things that I learned from you this summer and from Shazad as well. Um, and I incorporate those into the interviews that I do because oh, fantastic. It, it gives me a greater grasp of dealing with the people uh, that I'm interviewing and getting to know them better. And in each instance, I try uh, to go back to that five-year-old self because yeah. that's the five-year-old self before we go to school and before everything gets layered on top of us as, yeah. to, who, as to who we should be or should not be. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that, you know, we talk about being brothers and sisters, but we are all brothers and sisters. Right. And if we celebrated the uniqueness in every person we come in contact with, it would be a very different world that we live in. It would, wouldn't it? It would. And being able to find what I would love, what I hear you saying is you're finding empathy for these people. You're finding a source of deep compassion for them, which is really the secret sauce for life. Uh, I will have, I will be much more patient with people. I will be much more, uh, I don't know, uh, just open hearted with people. If I can really see that 
person deep down inside, that person who was like, before they, like you said, before they learned that they were wrong or that they were doing wrong things or that there was something about them that maybe wasn't. No, I, I was just interviewed for a magazine, uh, mm -hmm. which will be coming out in the next couple of months, folks. And it asked for one word to describe me. And the word mm -hmm. that I came up with, it was empath. Mm -hmm. you know, so because I do, I watch the news and I cry uh, over the families that are without over the holidays. Uh, my heart aches for all of them. Uh, my heart aches for those who are suffering during this time frame. Mm -hmm. And as you both and I both said, we're lucky. We're lucky yeah. with what we do have. Uh, but I want to go back. You started out on the career path of music. Uh, yeah. It was music that moved you forward in your life and career. Um, and uh, a, a lot of the information is on your website, which we will direct people to later on. Uh, but uh, when and how did the coaching aspect come about for you? Well, the coaching, I, I, you know, the first time I worked in Europe, you know, I was, they called me maestro and it was like, you know, that, that isn't something you hear in the U.S. so much. And, you know, it means a master of something or someone who has mastered something. And um, so I was a maestro when music was concerned and, and it was, it was, you know, it was tough, but I got used to it. It has a really lovely sound to it. But the other thing I was really a masterful at was self-destruction. Um, and and I think some of that came from those things I learned when I was a little boy that, you know, as I learned and as I matured, I learned I was intrinsically wrong somehow. You know, uh, I was raised in a very religious household. Um, you know, my uh, so so I learned from a very early age. And it's it's funny. I, I was also precocious in that I played. The, I, I keep pointing to my keyboard here. I played the piano for our church. And it was during that time that I was like maybe between 10 and 12 years old, I would be playing. And then I heard the pastor say one day, you know, he lumped, you know, uh, thieves, adulterers, pedophiles, uh, and homosexuals all into one category. And, and I didn't even know what that meant, but there was something inside me that thought, oh, maybe I might be uh, one of those, that, well, you that know, homosexual thing, you know? <laughs> Last night, I was watching that Touch of Mink, and I have seen the movie before. That's with Cary Grant and Dar's Day, 1962, uh, uh -huh. very much of that era. Uh, but Gig Young um, is going to a therapist, and the therapist walks out of the room in the middle of his session and comes back in, and he hears the end of what Gig Young is talking about. Uh, but because of this lapse of knowledge, the therapist thinks that Gig Young is gay. Now, interestingly enough, before he leaves the room, uh, he goes out because Gig Young works for a company and he has a stock tip. So he goes out to call his stockbroker. But when he thinks that Gig Young is gay, he comes, goes back to uh, his stockbroker and say, cancel that lead. It came from an unstable source. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, so we learn, right? And I've seen yeah. the movie so many times, but last yeah. night that was the first time it jumped out at me. Yeah. Yeah. And so what happened is I sort of, I don't know what happened in that situation in the movie, but for me, I, uh, I just sort of became aware that, oh, I didn't have it. I, I, out of the box, I'm wrong. I'm damaged goods. And so there came this, over the course of my life, up until I was about 50 years old, I'm 63 now, until I was about 50 years old, I pretty much was on a self-destructive path, even though um, life was happening for me in a good way. And so there came a time when I had to either get a grip on this, figure out a way to switch things in my life and, and make it an opportunity, right? Or well, crash and burn. Before you move on. I'm um, sorry, what? I want to ask you a question before we move on. Sure. Beyond your pastor making mm -hmm. that comment and it ringing, I mean, sticking mm -hmm. with you, yeah. were there other people in your life who were making other types of comments that were yeah. uh, that you were glomming onto? Oh yeah, I would hear it. It was the it was a joke, you know. It was a way to ridicule someone. To say, oh, you you know, that he's a little light in the loafers, or he's right, a little, right. you know, he's a little special. I would hear that from family members, you know. Mm -hmm. And it so that that rings really hard and true. 
Um, and I think that there was some of that. Listen, there's also, we are also born with certain proclivities that mm -hmm. may have exacerbated that, that may have made that something that made it really hard for me to get past, you know? But, you know, I think that we as humans are, are we're biased toward the negative anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this the dirty little secret is that we all self-destruct in some way, you know? And for me, it was like, uh, my mantra was more is more. And if some of this is going to be good, then a lot of it's going to be really great. You know, yeah. that just makes perfect sense, right? And um, and I do believe that we have a way of self-destructing, a way of self-medicating, if you will, mm -hmm. even if it's being negative, even if it's, uh, you can, you can o OD on sex, you can OD on drugs, you can OD on food, you know, you can OD on going to Broadway shows. I mean, you name it, it can be out of balance. Well, you know, I got a call today from a mutual friend. We have a friend who is on a very self-destructive path, very self-destructive. Mm. And I'm not gonna go into the details right now with what she's going through, uh, but uh, she, uh, I don't know if it's that she is incapable of moving on or if she refuses to move on. Mm. Uh, but um, as I said to my friend that called me today, these are choices that she's making. These, This is where I think that she is the most comfortable for be, uh, being. And I'm sure, especially in our profession, and I'm talking about the profession of the business of show, um, there are people who thrive. There's more drama going on in their personal lives than will ever go on on, their, on the stages. Unfortunately, I think Unfortunately. you're right. And what do you think are some of the steps based on what you've learned, we're going to talk about the book in a few moments, from positive intelligence that have helped you, uh, or let's just talk about your coaching in general, that have helped you to step outside of that sphere of discomfort? Um, I think, first of all, understanding that that's a lie. You know, what someone else believes about me isn't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. You know, not believing everything I think and uh, that's something that I tell a lot of my very close friends. Don't believe everything you think. It's not necessarily right, you know. Uh, and so that's that's a big one. Also, mindfulness techniques, which is really what you know Shirzad's work is all around a form of mindfulness, right? Uh, and so, mindfulness techniques helps us to be still, to be in the moment, and to be in our body. Mm -hmm. You know, we spend a lot of time rolling around up in here and uh, we have what I, you know, call the little committee that loves to chitter chatter and everyone has self-talk. Um, and uh, so that, so learning to catch that, to, you know, intercept it, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. And also to have someone that you trust. I mean, that's why I went into coaching was basically I, it, people need people who will listen, truly listen, not just listen so they could say the next thing, but mm -hmm. really listen and, and, and reflect and go, you know, what I'm hearing here is blah. How does that land for you? Does that mean anything to you when mm -hmm. I say that? And, you know, being honest with people, it's courageous stuff. You mm -hmm. got to be pretty fierce. And but that's what people are longing for. They're longing for people to be honest with them. Now, positive intelligence, did the book mm -hmm. find you or did you find the book? I, uh, both, both. I was in the early in my coach training and uh, I remember in one of the the classes, somebody said, oh, well, I think that's a saboteur. And I went, Whoa? you know, that thing where you go, <laughs> what? Yes. Oh, uh, what? And I think I'm, I, I think I might have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know, <laughs> you know, we all do. We all have tons of them. And they said, if you really want to know more about that, you should go at, the, there's a, one of our, a guy who used to be the CEO of the coach training school that I went to, Coactive uh, Coach Training, uh, CTI, it's called, Coach mm -hmm. Coactive Coaches Train. Training Institute. Uh, they've changed, they recently changed the, the name of it, so <laughs> throws me a little bit. They said, you should go read this book by Shirzad Shamin, who used to be the CEO of the school that I was I was uh, training with. And it's called Positive Intelligence. Well, you know, I, you know, I ordered it and bang, you know, I was I was there. And so I read that back uh, 2013, 2014. I think it was published in 2012. 
And uh, just really, it was fascinating to the point where I even created like weekend, like workshops for wellness retreats based around this. I just thought people need to know this. You know, people need to get a sense of where in their brain they are hanging out. Mm -hmm. We have a choice, you know, and the, the bias, the place that we're used to hanging out is the negative place, the survival brain. And that they call that the limbic system, the amygdala, you know, when, when people have fight, flight, freeze, appease, you know, when they're ready to, to leap or get angry, that's the survival brain. And when I read that there is no wisdom in the survival brain, I, I had another one of those moments like, what? Mm -hmm. You mean that if I'm caught and I am living from that part of my brain, I don't have access to my executive functions, which is, you know, where the, it lies in the middle prefrontal cortex. So obviously I've done a lot of studying around this and, and, and it's enough to make, uh, you know, it'll, it's enough to make you pass out from just boredom probably with all the names of the brain parts. But it is fascinating that we will do everything. We'll go to gyms and we'll work the muscles in our arms. Some people will, that will, they'll run, they'll ride bikes, but they will not do, they'll do very little to create good brain fitness, mental fitness. Now, one of the exercises in the book, of course, are the PQ reps. Right. Uh, the positive was, intelligence reps, like a gym rep. Yeah. It's like, a, you know, a gym rep. And, you know, it was so funny because we were doing this in the summer. And I've told you this before, but uh, I have the app on my iPhone. And as soon as Shirzad's voice would come on, uh, we have a, a Maltese puppy would come running towards me because he knew that I was going to go to sit outside. I have a special spot that I meditate oh. in and I do my PQ reps there and I do them throughout the day. And it's just this getting up from your desk, going out there. You know, a, a lot of people used to do cigarette breaks. Right. Do yeah. a PQ rep break, which gets yeah. you away from your desk, go mm -hmm. outside, walk around the house. You know, if you, you know, anything you can do just to get away from the desk and the clutter that starts building up. Um, you've worked with Shirzad, haven't you? I'm actually, yeah, I'm working with him now. I do, uh, I'm do. i doing um, the training to become a certified in positive intelligence. It's a six month program, uh, it, it's, but it's going been going on for a while. That all comes to sort of a head in January, February. And I'm also I'm a facilitator of the work the classes, the program, which is a six, really seven week program where we meet once a week. And also there's an app involved that helps you rehearse. Re not well, practice, I'm going to ask rehearse. you about that. God, I'm you such think? a, I'm so, uh, you know, we're going to rehearse. We practice. It's a practice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we did the workshop uh, again, it was six weeks Um, is in the book goes further than that, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but is there a reason that you don't go beyond the first six weeks or have you done a workshop that went for the duration of the book? Um, I have created a second tiered of, of the thing. I'll tell you why. I mean, it's just a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. And also it takes an ongoing practice. I think that if you were to get immersed in all of it, right at, once, I think it, it would do more harm than good, perhaps. It would certainly be overwhelming, you know. And the idea of taking it really easy over the course of six weeks and really practicing every day to stop, you know, kind of get present in whatever way works best for you. And the PQ reps are nothing more than paying really, mm -hmm. I love his wording on this, paying exquisite attention to some detail, whether it's the sounds you hear, which is another form of meditation, whether it's the, just the feeling. I love the one where it's just feeling, uh, you know, closing your eyes and feeling rubbing two fingers together and noticing the ridges on the fingers. It mm -hmm. will get you present really fast. Mm -hmm. And it's all about becoming present. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I feel like I got off. Did I answer your question? No, you did answer that question. <laughs> no. When we did the workshop this summer, were we our first group that you were doing this with? Yes, you were, you no. were my, you were, I, I handpicked you guys. It's like, oh, I want to do this with people that I trust and I know, you know, are going to dive in and you guys did. 
And I learned so much from doing that. Now I've done a number of these groups and it will be an ongoing thing. Yeah. Now I know that some of the people that are watching right now are part of the New York City cabaret scene. Okay. Um, and so you are now doing this with Mac, uh, the Manhattan Association of Cabarets and Clubs. Uh, no, Signasium. That's not Signasium. Yeah. Signasium. Um, tell us a little bit about what Signasium is and what you're able to bring to the table with uh, positive intelligence. Well, what's really lovely is as a person who's kind of using positive intelligence in the world of performers, it really rings true there, doesn't it? I mean, it, as performers, we're, we're already, I think we already have a unique set of uh, things that we're, we're fighting. But most of the time we feel, you know, let, let's name it, let's talk about performance anxiety, let's talk about uh, imposter syndrome. You know, I, I the first the first few shows I wrote, I mean, I was in the middle of a West End theater and there was an orchestra coming in and they were tearing the theater apart and putting it in. I go, someday they're going to realize that I'm a fake, you know? And I mean, we have these things that, and, and for a multi-million dollar, multi-million dollar, multi-million pound production. Mm -hmm. um, so we as performers, as people in the entertainment industry, uh, it's really important for us to get centered uh, as to who we are, what we do, and have that sense of, you know, be able to think clearly with clarity, you know, when it's time to perform, not be bothered by those worries that you're not going to do it right. And uh, just that's, that's why it's important. I think, I think it's everything to do with performance and becoming a better performer. And how uh, did this come about? For me? Yes, for Signature. Uh, Oh, for Signasium. Well, uh, it's it's interesting. I, I put the word out there for the classes and then Lenny uh, contacted me and says, hey, I'm really interested in this. This might be something that Signasium would be interested in. And, um, and then I started telling him more about it. And he says, well, this might be something I'd be interested in. So <laughs> Le Lenny actually took the, the, wow. the program too. And uh, now we have two... Uh, classes going with Signasium for the six week program. Mm -hmm. And um, the second level one that I do uh, on my own here uh, is about taking a, pro uh, a project, whether it's finishing a show, writing a book, you know, uh, doing something in the world of entertainment and applying all of these principles to it so that you do it from a more positive place. And since You've delved into this. I mean, it's become like a second layer to you, obviously. Um, how has this affected your life uh, oh, on, yeah. a, a, you know, a, a f first level? And then I want to know how your life has transformed as a result of what you've learned from Shazad. Oh, that's that's a lot there. Let's see if I'll try. I'll do my best. Keep me on track. Okay. okay. Keep me on track. Uh, so, you know, I came about it because I would I was already a certified coach. Coaching, I feel like, is a, a really lovely. Uh, and I always showed up as a coach, whether it was a vocal coach or teaching piano or, you know, you, you name it. I was always a coach anyway. But being a, an, in, a coach in an intentional, trained way, I think, is a, a wonderful, a wonderful practice. And then I found out that he was doing, he was going to create a cohort of coaches that would learn this. And what it has done is transformed how I show up for my coaching clients. Uh, it's really very powerful stuff. And so this becomes a baseline for my work with them. Uh, and then we have that language, like you and I can now, we can sit down and talk about what do you think, who do you think, what saboteur you think's messing with you right now, Richard? <laughs> You know, and, and it's not, and it's not weird. It's just like, oh, you know, I think, I think I'm, you know, something here is making me be a controller in this situation or making me be, I'm avoiding, I'm, I feel like myself, I'm trying to push this away. I wonder what that is. So you get to really talk very specifically about you know, things. Funny. I was watching a documentary last night on Reagan and uh -huh. Ronnie Reagan Jr. was talking Ooh. and said his father had a tendency when he would talk, he would physically do the hands and, you know, push away uh, when he was talking to someone. And he said if, if he was doing that, it was essentially saying to the person on a subconscious level, 
um, I'm pushing this away from me. Yeah. Something I'm not going to address. And it's something I'm not going to deal with. And there were so many things that he did that with, as you and I both know, um, going through his presidency. It, it is interesting. And what one thing I'm finding out now is that these saboteurs are these active, like there's an assessment, you know, that that a free assessment you can take online. If you if you're kind of curious, like what might be, you know, and the, the saboteurs are, uh, there's the judge, that's the big that's the big judge, you know, it's like we're judging everything always anyway. And so there's the the main judge, we're judging not only ourselves, but others, and we're judging the circumstances. And then there are nine accomplice saboteurs, and this is kind of fun. And even these saboteurs, uh, we they point to probably something that is a gift in us. So there's the stickler, there's the pleaser. And I'm curious for your listeners, if any of these will come up as like, oh, I'm this, Sounds very familiar. Stickler, pleaser, hypervigilant, uh, restless, controller, avoider, the hyperachiever, the victim, the hyper rational. You know, some people think they can think their way out of everything or they overthink. There are the people who are constantly victims. Things are always happening to them. And what you what we find when we do this work is we go, oh, hmm. I see what's going on there. Maybe this is this is you know something that's out of balance in your life that maybe needs to get pulled back in. The controller, uh, the I had a really uh, and and I and I keep track of. I keep bringing my my app up. I keep track of where I am on that. I have really strong controller. Imagine that controller, uh, pleaser, and hyperachiever. Bang, bang, bang. And, you know, that's a really slick tag team. That's enough to really throw and a wrench in competing anything. for first place. Oh, competing. And, and, <laughs> and really, and it's so manipulative, at, like the, the pleasing. You know, like, like, have you ever been around somebody who just constantly just needs you to be okay with them? Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. creepy. And I used to be that person really, really badly. It's like, oh, this is, mm. people back away from that eventually. And when you realize how manipulative that is, and then we kind of go, oh, well, what can I do instead? And what we can do instead is get connected to that, that more sage-like part of your brain. And uh, that's where confidence comes from. That's mm -hmm. where we are confident and we have self-esteem and we have clarity of mind and we have compassion for others. Well, what I love uh, uh, once again about the workshop that we did this summer, and I hope it's okay that I mentioned this, was that, sure. your, that your husband was also part of the group. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think that this would be a great thing to do for couples um, because I think a lot of couples may be consciously or not even consciously aware of which one of their saboteurs um, are affecting their marriage. If you go into a situation or relationship, mm -hmm. you go into a situation knowing this is who I am, uh, this is who you are, and I'm able to deal with this. Um, mm -hmm. I think that much more, uh, many more relationships would be saved. With this. I, th I think you're right. It also just is such a great way to have a conversation. It's a real civilized, wonderful way to talk about things that might be coming up. And I want to also clarify something like when I say sage, I'm talking about that prefrontal cortex, that executive mm -hmm. function of the brain, nothing more than that. It's just right. like, am I going to that more evolved place, more highly evolved place up here? Or am I going to the survival brain? And so when we access that and what true love and what we find out unconditional love is, is the dance of the sage. It's mm -hmm. sort of like one person's sage being in love with another person's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you don't want to have is the dance of the saboteurs. No, <laughs> that, exactly. That, there's never, there's never going, that's never going anywhere good. You but know, it's doing this with you this summer. I am, <laughs> I love um, collaboration uh, for me. And I think you know that about me. I love being part of a group. Uh, I love the mindset of different minds coming together and creating. But I'm finding that now in group situations and settings, I'm going, okay, this is who this person <laughs> is. This is who this person is. This is who th this person is. And it makes me a whole lot, it, it makes everything a whole lot easier in terms of, uh, just making everything meld together and come together. Mm. Oh, and that's I also, wonderful. And I also find that um, I don't have that need for, to make 
sure that my sage uh, is in first place or that my saboteur gets relegated to second place. It's, you know, I'm looking at the dynamics of interaction with other people in a whole different way than I did before I did the workshop. I'm so glad to hear that. It's wonderful. It's been great for me too. It's it solidified a lot of things that I was already working on. I know that you've always you've done a lot of work on yourself as a human yeah. being. Yeah. And we both have. And and I it's something that I always took that's my responsibility. That's on me to know me and to be in be the one who's making wise choices for me. Um and for me too as far as collaborations go, um I can sense with like, oh, mm, you know, I don't need to exacerbate that part of that person. Maybe there's something I can do here that will help soothe that and put that at ease, you know, and maybe access the sage part of that person because it's always there just waiting, just waiting to be, you know, some, you know, we, we, we all are just waiting to be understood and loved and part of, you know. Now I want to ask you uh, based on, uh, positive intelligence again. How do you feel having gone through this that it has helped you in terms of dealing with 2020? And I'm not talking about vision, I'm talking about the year we've been going through. Yeah, I, I know. Um, well, it's so interesting to me, I think it's fascinating that this all sort of came together right at the beginning of the pandemic. And mm -hmm. I think we were all looking for a way to be in this and be okay with it. I know I was, and oh, yeah. I was looking for a more powerful way, a more effective way, uh, because you, you might not be surprised, but you know, the coaching business sort of blossomed during this time. People need support. And I was saying, how am I gonna, how can we do this? So this work was really great when you think that the sage perspective on anything is that, that this is a gift and this is an opportunity. This, every situation, every circumstance can in some way be turned into a gift or an opportunity. Now, that's not to say things are not sad. That's not to say things, there are some things that are just not good. They're, they're bad. They, they, I'm not here to be Pollyanna, right? You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be that person that you just want to smack and go, shut up. It's awful. It is <laughs> awful. There's a lot of awful things. But then I can look and I can see, I mean, I lost... I mean, just to share a little bit, I, I mean, I lost my last two remaining aunts and uncles. My aunt lived to 99 <laughs> and then died of COVID. And there's just something intrinsic, just something utterly completely wrong about that to live this wonderful, good life. And then, and then, then to have it go that way. What I can say is that, um, she doesn't have to go on any longer in this crazy world, you know, mm -hmm. and she's no longer suffering. And, and I know that that's, that's one way of looking at it. But if we look at it, what is the gift here? What is the opportunity? Now, you can't always find that. And that's sort of the sage perspective. But maybe there's a, a time we'd be willing to find and to see mm -hmm. the gift and what there is, you know. Uh, I think a lot of people are having moments where they're really getting real with themselves as a result of the world we're in today in 2020. And I think there may be some good that comes from that. I like to, I like to think there is. I know it's been some for me. You know, two things that are running through my mind. First of all, our dear friend, Russ Woolley, he always says uh, rejection is God's protection. And oh, I, I, I'm with him on that. And yeah. I love that. Um, also, David Friedman uh, says we're all in this together but we're not in the same boat. And I love Ooh, Yeah, that. that's really powerful, isn't in it? In terms of looking at the way, you know, we're dealing with things. But I also find that right now, uh, I hear from, from so many people is, I can't wait until this is over and I have my life back. Mm. And those people to me are suspended. Uh, they're mm. just, you know, stationary. Uh, and I say to them, you know, I hate to put it out there, but this is your life. This right. is your life, this very moment. We have our life back right now in this moment, don't we? It's, they, it's a, it's, but what I'm hearing you just say too is that they're constantly waiting for that magical moment when everything is going to be okay. And, and, I, and the thing I've learned, if I have learned anything during this time, is that this is the magical moment, my friend. Mm -hmm. Right at this very this very second, this very second, this very second, this very second is 
the magical moment. And we, you know, if we, if we're constantly waiting to be happy, we're going to be waiting. And once we get to that place, we're going to be waiting for another thing to be happy. It is a vicious cycle. It's that carrot, you know, that carrot that the, what is it? The horse chases, you know, we're chasing carrot. It's, it's, you're always living in a state of waiting for the magical thing. When I get into a Broadway show, I'll be happy. When, right. When Probably I Probably not. I hate to break it to you, right? No. It's not going to. Uh, but I've, but just this uh, frame of reference, um, um, I get the Broadway show. When I get my Tony nomination, I'll be happy. When oh. the show runs a year, I'll be happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll be happy. Yeah. yeah. Be happy. yeah. It's that, it, you know, it's that um, treadmill with the carrot in front of us that people are constantly chasing. So how can you be happy now is the big question. It's like that is, and that is the answer. It's being happy in this moment is always the answer. Do I have aspirations? A hundred percent. Do I have things that will make me incredibly happy if they happen? Yes. But I am in process. I'm, I, I, I say this with my clients, my coaching clients. It's like, if you're always looking for that goal to happen, then until that goal happens, you're living in failure. That's no way to live. But you can be in a positive process. You can get up and live your day to the best that you know how to live it. You can do the things that bring you joy and bring others joy. And as these things happen, have a daily process so that you're always, you know, that's your goal is to live. Well, you have been living, eating and breathing and sleeping this uh, for the past X number of months uh, right, I have, yeah. and beyond. Um, what was that? I have. Yes, I have. You're, you're right. And I want to know what you have learned about yourself that has surprised you the most Ooh. having gone through this. Um, I think it was the pleaser. I think it was the saboteurs. You know, I did that assessment and I saw which, which uh, ones were hot, hot, to trot there. And it was that the, I, I never thought of myself as a controller, but I guess I was. And, and if I couldn't control the situation, then I would manipulate people by being a pleaser until the situation became what I wanted it to be. And it was all about being the hyperachiever. And as long as I was achieving this, I was happy. And I felt like a valid human being worthy of taking up space and breathing air on this planet. Uh, so realizing that about myself and realizing how uncomfortable that probably has been for many people in my life um, was a big learning. You know, I always thought of myself as like this sweet guy. I, you know, I wouldn't hurt a fly. You know, oh, I would. I would hurt a fly. But I, you know, uh, but not really. You know, was there and, a time that you've gone through yeah. life, and maybe you still do, I don't know, yeah. uh, where you uh, were always thinking about how others perceived you? Oh, and yeah, I think so. Don't we do that? I mean, I think, I think most people do. And then there's a part of it. And here's the lie there is like, well, I must. I must be critical of how I think people see me. Otherwise I will never be successful or I will, I will do things that are stupid. And the, the, the truth is that that's a, that's a real waste of energy, but I do believe that. I, I think that there was, I think that brings about a lot of fear mm -hmm. and that again, fear has a tendency to, well, it, it, it manifests in many ways, right? Fear will either make us angry, you know, or it will also overwhelm us and paralyze us. And um, I do a lot of work with artists who are paralyzed from fear. You know, a writer, I'm afraid I'm not going to finish the book. I'm afraid I'm go not going to write a good song. And it used to paralyze me. There was like, you know, in writing music, it was like, ah, you know, just uh, get it out there. You can always correct it. You can always throw it away. But just let something come out. Let's do something. Don't, don't stop. You know? Now, are you doing any one-on-one -on -one coaching or is it all group coaching? I do. I do some one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's, uh, I am leaning more toward groups right now, mainly uh, just for time's sake. Mm -hmm. I'm also writing four shows. There's a, a I'm, I'm, a, I have three on the front burner right now. Yeah, uh, I told I, you, Dana, you don't have to write those shows for me. Not right now. <laughs> Focus, focus on what you're doing. <laughs> and we'll get back to me later. <laughs> so 
Uh, now, which uh, one of those? Uh, you're so sweet, and I appreciate that. Noted. And I will. <laughs> so, so we'll... which one of those, um, uh, <laughs> you know, judges popped up just for you, Ray? <laughs> none. Uh, none. It's like, I, you know, you know what came up for me? That's what's funny. It's like, oh, gee, I, I wish I could write a show <laughs> <laughs> Richard, it just, it just, you know, it's what popped up is like, uh, and then I'm starting a, a, a series of short films, uh, a series of sort of uh, like horror shorts, it, horror shorts. <laughs> what kind of a phrase is that in January? Uh, scoring, scoring those. I, uh, I, I thought, wow, I am. There is a lot going on here, uh, but it's all. What I will say is that it's all stuff I absolutely love, and I get to do it with people that I adore, like you, Richard, like the, you. the people that are in these. I and and also look, you know how enter, doing doing the world of entertainment and show business. You know, you 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 fall in love with these people. You know, you absolutely do, and I think that's the other reason I was drawn to being a coach. Uh, I am, like I said, I, I have some private. Uh, clients, but very, very few at this point. It's just a time thing. And, uh, but as a coach, I get to absolutely fall in love with these people and see their lives transformed. Who gets to do that? I mean, it's wonderful. You know, I wouldn't want to do anything else. Now, beyond know? Signasium, are uh -huh. there other areas where you're teaching right now as well? I want to focus on your classes before we run out of time. Sure. Thank you. Um, I am going to be doing a workshop for a Signature Theater in Virginia, a virtual workshop with them around I the same thing. Formed at Signature Theater. I, it's I, a gorgeous place, isn't it? Yes. They're wonderful. They've been really big fans of, uh, big supporters of John Dempsey and my work, uh, The Fix, The Witches of Eastwick, Blackbeard, uh, mm -hmm. Brother Russia is one of the shows they did of ours. Um, so they, I, they, I, still, you know, I, I still want to see The Witches of Eastwick here in New York. You know. Oh, I would love that. We just had a, a really rock 'em sock 'em right before the pandemic. Boom! It was like we were in Sweden with a beautiful pr production there. So I would love that too. Thank you from your mouth to God's ears. Let's make Absolutely. it happen. Absolutely. Now uh, we. I, I don't want us to run. I'm watching the time because you've got a class to teach. Yeah, right? I do. <laughs> um, and is uh, so. I hope that this was just the setup. Uh, this was the opening act for your class. <laughs> And uh, who is this for Signasium that you're doing this afternoon? This is yeah. This is uh, one of the Signasium classes, the Monday night class. And, and if people are interested in taking your class, um, and feel free, and I mean this, anytime you're doing a class or anything, please post the information on my page as well or oh, tag. Will. Thank you. So that we can get it out. Uh, so uh, how can people I think Signasium is amazing? They're doing so many great classes, right? And I feel so proud to be a part of that. And I want to ask you, and you may have touched upon this uh, before we, uh, just a lightning round of things. Um, over the past 12 months, what have you uh, embraced the most? What about my husband? <laughs> because here we're in, in the same space and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, embrace, you know, positive uh, knowing that, uh, it's on me. I have choices and I can choose where, where I go with things, where, how I think. You know, and what, what have you resisted the most? What have I resisted? The, the negativity, understanding that that is, uh, so it's a, it's a closed ended journey mm -hmm. and there may be being negative might be, you know, even being, you know, snarky and cynical, which I, you know, have known to be, in my life uh, is a short term win. You know? Do you find that you're the snarkiest when you're around other snarky people? In the past I have been because it's that desire to please, desire to be part of, you know, I could get out the, as they say, what is it? The, you know, the library is open <laughs> and I could read you just like anybody, you know, right. but, but it's not, uh, it, there's, it just ends up being not fun. I end up feeling gross. Uh, that's just the best way I could describe it, you know? Wow. And, uh, and that's what I'm all about, celebration. 
celebrate everybody. Uh, well, you know, I knew I was going to have fun talking with you. Well, you know, it, it means so much I, that we did this. We still have a few minutes before okay, we yeah, yeah. Can talk uh, for your sake. So uh, but um, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, if you enjoyed today's show, and I hope that you did, and if you haven't done so already, I don't expect you to go back if you've done it already. But if you haven't done so already, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Sign my guest book with your thoughts about today because that helps to boost me in other markets. Uh, I want to let everyone know, and I am so excited about this, tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock, I am celebrating Karen Ziamba. And we have some incredible clips that we're going to show and uh, some surprises for her as well, I think. Um, so I'm very, very excited about this. I end all my shows by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, so I'm going to suggest that you uh, buy two copies of Positive Intelligence or do what I did. Listen to the audiobook because yeah, his good. voice is so relaxing, Shirzad's, <laughs> and getting really into it. Um, get one for yourself. And then go to your Facebook friends list, it's the holiday season, and buy the book for the second name that pops up on your friends list. And they'll thank you. Or if you wanna be very magnanimous, buy them a session in the class, you know? Uh, but make so sure- much fun. But make sure that it's something that they wanna to commit to because it is a commitment. And it's it's a, intense. It's, a, it's, it's intense and it's a personal uh, commitment. Now, before we end today, um, I want to give you the final word. I want you to either expound on anything that we've covered today that you would like to add to, or uh, if there's anything that we didn't cover that you wish that we had, now's your chance to do so, or mm -hmm. any message that you want to put out to everyone at this time. And again, thank you, Dana. You, you are one of my favorite people. And I'm not saying that just because you're sitting in the seat right now. Oh, you're sweet. Yeah. And and it's it's true. It, it's the same, Richard. I feel the same with you. When we first met, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Um, what do I want to, to leave people with? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think this idea of celebration is wonderful. I think that we're here, you know, for each other. Mm -hmm. One of the things I believe deeply is that we're all here for something very important, you know, uh, and for a reason. And um, I would encourage people to search for that reason. Mm -hmm. It's the most fulfilling way of being on this earth. You know, um, I'm not suggesting religion or anything like that. And if that works for you, great. But I'm just talking about um, connecting with other people and learning to have not only, uh, well, not only, but to start with yourself, unconditional love for yourself, compassion for yourself, empathy for yourself, and then then learn to, you know, have that for others. Um, I love the definition of this mental fitness that I've been talking about, this positive intelligence, is your capacity to respond to life's challenges with positivity rather than negativity. And you know that is a, a way of telling how mentally fit you are. And it, you know, are you ready for any boulder that might drop in front of you? And it's it's important to to get your mind in a good shape, good shape in a good place. So if you have that opportunity, do it. And uh, the book is a great place to start. There are lots of books that talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And would you say everyone uh, hello to everyone in the class today? For me? Oh, I will. I sure will. I, I absolutely, I'll see them in just a few minutes and okay. I will say hello to them. Have a great class. Thank you, Richard. You're awesome. Thank, thank you, you so much. Don't tell me, tell everybody else. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And I'll take it. Thank you.